Welcome to the God is Not an Asshole podcast. If you are one of the many people done with religious dogmatism, hang on. You might sense transcendence, but your church or other faith community never seem to get off the ground. You realize that honoring your conscience means more than fitting in and keeping hard to explain rules? Hang on. You could probably think of the goodness in your tradition, and you tried your best to save that baby, but there's so much bathwater. Join your host, David Norman Moore Jr. in California and Carrie Connolly in New Jersey, who are collaborating to bring on guests who have found life on the other side of fundamentalism. Guests with stories of how they have liberated themselves from beliefs that divide us from each other. None of our guests' narratives are identical, but we hope you'll find something in common with each of them. We invite you to experience our common bond as we all inspire even more of us to embrace the true self. Do you, Barb, um, and everybody, we're talking with uh, Barb Parmet, who I met originally through Jewish Voice of Peace, and now she's on the... uh, the executive board of the Santa Barbara affiliate of the NAACP and just in the community. And um, I just really appreciate your presence here with us, Barb. To me, uh, you're, you're kind of rare. And I, my understanding is from talking with a couple of other friends who are Jewish, but uh, they all are like you, they are, anti-Zionism, they, they, they tell me that there are larger cities. If they lived in, a, in, a, in an urban center, mm-hmm. they would have more friends, more people. They wouldn't be outcasts as much because they could find each other. Do, do you find that to be your experience, your Absolutely. analysis? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's partly why I'm in the National Jewish Voice for Peace. When those people talk, when I'm on a Zoom with 200 people are Jewish Voice for Peace at a national level. And I know what they did in New Jersey and Philadelphia and how they won in Atlanta, Georgia and the city council. You know, then I could go, okay, I'm okay. You know, yeah. we're in this together. It's more than me. That's why it, I re- it really helps me to just know they're there, just like knowing you're there. You're my mm. beloved community. My beloved community is pretty expansive. And I, anytime I can... You know, when you're on the margin, you're like, I'm a solidarity person because I don't have one. I don't have a group that I can uh, say, oh, you're mine or I'm yours. Yeah. That's not it. And this and is a bit of the way we have to challenge ourselves and ask who who do we really want to be around? And, you know, the, these questions that you're discussing, too, are they, they are so deep and they cannot be caught up because the issues are so complex and yet people want us to put them into sound bites and tweets, right? And so I know that uh, as somebody who is both deeply um, aligned with with wanting to resist and combat any sort of anti-Semitism that people are experiencing here in the United States, at the same time, I can hold that and at the same time critique the nation of Israel for what they are doing to the Palestinian people, right? It doesn't have to be a this or that, but people want to make it a this or that, right? So if I speak out about the ways that the Palestinians are being brutalized by the Israeli regime, and then over here, then automatically I'm, I'm an anti-Semite and, and I can be of no value in the, in the resistance against white supremacy here, right? Or white Christian supremacy and patriarchy here. And, and so I think that's one of the things that, that I really try to speak out against in the work that I do is, is in, it, it trying to expand people's minds and, and abilities to hold paradox and to hold more than one truth at the same time, right? It's, it's frustrating to me and it feels very lonely, like you said. I do want to say one, I can't say one thing because you <laughs> say the word anti-Semitism and it just, it's so challenging because I've been in, I started at one point where we were going to have, have a discussion with a few people from Jewish Voice for Peace about anti-Semitism. All hell broke loose. You know, the Christian felt totally attacked. Everybody felt attacked in every way. And now 
Jews themselves are weaponizing it. I mean, that's the thing that the right wing has done. They've weaponized anti-Semitism so that real anti-Semitism, when people hate Jews, that's anti-Semitism for no reason. And that can manifest in many ways. But when we're talking about the Israeli apartheid regime and the occupation of the Palestinian people, that's not anti-Semitism. That's just bull. Boom, Bucky crap. You can say it. You can say it. <laughs> <laughs> this is not it's a in family the title. show. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it's just not, it, you know, but yeah. they, they have a big voice and there is a lot of investment by the Israeli government. It's called Hasbara. Hasbara is a word of, uh, they use it. It's propaganda. Mm-hmm. And these, one of the One of the ways I've seen that play out is in trips that, subsidized trips for church staff members that are over to Israel where they are filled with, you know, all of the horrible things that the the terrorism of the Palestinians and like, quote, I'm using air quotes for those people who are just listening, right? All of those, those um, justifications for, for what the government is doing, justifications. And I've, I've spoken with people who've come back and it's as though they are, they have consumed everything uh, and and are regurgitating it back as it's their really, own thoughts. Okay, it's so, fascinating. So I'm one of the people who was sponsored for one of those trips who didn't yeah. come back enamored of the political power. Um, you know, I remember go- visiting, there were 15 of us, and I remember visiting this uh, this school that had teachers, some of whom were Jews and some who were Arabs. And uh, this was, you know, this was the PR, right? To see how everybody's getting along. But they never interviewed the Arabs with us present. And I felt like that might have been intentional. Hmm. Um, And I also, I happened to be in Israel. I've been there twice. I I happened to be there when... um, 40,000 Ethiopians were airlifted um, mm. in an emergency into uh, Israel, and uh, we were taken to a camp. Uh, in fact, when the trip was planned, that was not expected to be on the itinerary, but it, you know, it just happened. And I remember all of these, I'll, I'll just call them for lack of a better term right now, all of these black kids surrounding me like 500 of them surrounding me and the look on their face said oh you get it (laughs) 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 yeah that was that was some that's that was very memorable well when the staff member came back from israel at my church and i was as a member of staff he came and he debriefed us, right? He basically regurgitated all of the propaganda that he heard. And oh, yeah. I, That's the I point. I questioned it. That's exactly the point. <laughs> and then I was supposed to go and regurgitate it, but I was questioning it and I was resisting it. And I was very well reprimanded by the pastor and basically told to shut up Ooh. and stop asking questions. Yeah, Christian, Christian uh, Zionism is a powerful thing in this society. And it I follows mean, the money. It follows it the follows money. It follows the money. It it's in Congress. You know, I mean that it's... was that's really a very painful part of as a Jew watching right wing Jews so totally support go whole in supporting the Christian nationalism, you know, whether they're like anti Semitic or not, it doesn't matter. They were for Israel. And so it's like such a weird, it used to be like, I can't believe this is happening. But now we see how it's the greed, it's the power, and that's, they don't care. They don't care how evil they are or you are. They just want what they want and they're going to get it. Yep. And I will say that some organizations that I have worked with, um, I have kind of seen firsthand that, and these are Jewish organizations, that they would not want to anger donors, wealthy Jewish donors who are supporting them, right, by coming out in full support of 
the Black community when the Black community needs them. Mm -hmm. And that has proven to be a very, very dicey. I've watched, I've had to watch, I've watched these people navigating these, these issues. And nationally, you know, these, these are national platforms. And, um, and Carrie, wouldn't you say that's because there is a strong pro-Palestinian uh, stance among many African-Americans, especially the ones who don't identify as evangelicals? I think it's that. I think it's just plain anti-Blackness. Yeah. I think it's, you know, um, if, a, if a white-bodied, let's face it, you know, a white-bodied Jew is higher up on the racial hierarchy and closer to whiteness than a, a dark-skinned Black person, right? So it's all about that the embodiment and the ways that those identity markers that are embodied, right? And so, and protecting the place, our place on that, on that racial hierarchy. And so when you talk about, when you combine money with that, right? And donors, and you're, you are a large organization that needs to, you know, that has a voice in the, in the, in this world, in the world of justice. But how are you going to pick when you're going to, what you're going to stand up for? when your donors are on, potentially. I, I should stop talking because I don't want to say too much. And Yeah, this is a dangerous um, thing. I mean, I could name all the Jewish organizations, mainstream organizations that I fight against. Yep. But there, I'm, I'm sure I, I'll I you and I could have some conversations. <laughs> I don't think that's a way to win. Yeah. Say that again. I'm sorry. I, I talked over you. Please excuse me. I don't think we can win by directly attacking these organizations. No, it's right. not, it doesn't work because there's too much power there. And there's too few of us with not enough power. I mean, whether it's financial or otherwise. And so I, I believe there's a, that's why we do resistance work. Resistance work is always underfunded, undersupported. Uh, there's no, the mainstream doesn't support resistance because that's what we're fighting. Yep. Yep. It's, and it's all these different ways. I think the reason it's important to talk about those kinds of things, though, is because those larger organizations are the ones that have the microphone. And then people who are used to tweets and sound bites hear those kinds of things and, and say, oh, okay, well, that's what they said. So I'm going to, I'm going to parrot that back. Right. And that's why I, I so appreciate the opportunity to do a podcast like this, for example, because we can, we can take the time to, to spread this complexity out. Right. And, and look at all of the different pieces and not just re resort to sound bites and tweets. I, I would like to throw out, I read something this morning. I read Haaretz, which is the daily left paper in Israel. And it had a report on a group in Philadelphia that is, and they're all, even mainstream Jews now, who are not for Palestinians, but they are against the ruling of Netanyahu and what he's doing to the Supreme Court and how he's destroying even more so whatever level of democracy they may have. And this group in Philadelphia tracked down one of the main donors of an organization that supports a candidate, it was like very convoluted because that's how this is, supported candidates in the United States who were supporting Israel, no matter what. And they right. found the name, the head donor of this guy, and they, and they live in that neighborhood. These are upper middle class Jews or rich Jews, I don't know, and they live next to this billionaire guy. And they started protesting in front of his house. And when all this stuff is going on in Israel, they had a huge, they had like 30 or 40 people showing up in the neighborhood. It went national. This guy has had to pull his donations out of the organizations because it's just not publicly looking too good for him. And so that's really how you do it. It's so like, those are his own people protesting. Yeah. Yes. This is important. This kind of courage is what we need. We need people who are insiders. To stand up to their own, you know, you know, not just among Jews, but in, in every group that has a power dynamic that excludes and oppresses, we need people to speak up. We're, we're calling for this kind of courage. And we're also calling for 
for us to connect with one another in whatever way, you know, even if it's kind of transient, we need to know each other. We need to know that we exist. Yeah. You know, um, you know, there, there may be a future relationship between Barb, between you and Carrie. Carrie lives in New Jersey, so it may not be as likely as us <laughs> who live in the same uh, city. But the thing is, is that we need to know that we exist. And that's the purpose of this, this podcast. You know, this show is about get, you know, telling everybody, whoever will listen that, um, your courage matters. Yeah. I'll speak to that. I just gave a talk about my work and started truth telling in ways that I don't usually do. And I met a black academic who had converted to Judaism. And she, we have the best conversation because she's anti-Zionist as well, but mm, has these different connections that I, but she, we would never have known each other if I were in, hadn't revealed myself. And so this courage you're talking about, it, it's scary. But then all of a sudden these worlds open up to you and you connect with people like yourselves and New Jersey is not that far when we're talking about struggles, when we're That's talking right. about showing up, when we're talking about, yeah, making these things work. So here's my question. And this is the question that I always come down to in my own work. It's the driving question. You know, I, I always say that white people have a failure of imagination. And that's why we cling to white pseudo supremacy, I call it, because um, it's not true. It's not real. <laughs> so I call it pseudo supremacy. But we, we cling to it because we don't know how to how to be white bodied without being white, without aligning ourselves with the construct of the power of white supremacy. So what what is your imagination for something new? What is your imagination for a way to be um, Jewish and not Zionist, perhaps, or whatever, however you would describe it? What is your imagination for the new thing? That's what we talk about. I think for Jews, I mean, I've gone through this for so long, but it's not really a struggle for me to talk about my Jewish identity anymore. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed of who I am. And bringing up Israel is not a problem, bringing up Palestine. But for people, I know this is true. It was true for myself 20 years ago. How do, how do people, how can we bring them in to face themselves? Because it, yes, whether you're Christian or Jewish, if you have to face this baseline of like, they right. are not telling you the truth and they never have told you the truth. <laughs> and if you right. face that, then it's like everything collapses. And when it all co- that's a very, very challenging spiritual, psychological, every single way it can destroy your, your community and your family. We know these things. So it's yep. not a simple process. Yep. And so courage, say who you are, be willing to look at yourself. I mean, that's what, that's what we've done. So to, 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 to take that even further, because that's the next step. That's the part that I, and I, and I'm going to tell you, I think it's a trick question because if we knew we would have, we would be there already. Right. right. But, right. but that's, that's always the edge that I'm trying to push us toward is once we do, once white people do the deconstruction of, of white, of our white identity, once men do the deconstruction of their patriarchy and once Zionists do the deconstruction of, of that, right? What do we then come together to create? What does it look like? Mm. How does it feel in the body? What does it look like for land ownership? If there is even land ownership after that, right? That's the imagination I want us to drive, drive us to, because otherwise we just end up here in a, in a circular sound box echo chamber, right? So what do you have? Do you have thoughts about that? What that imagination could look like beyond? You know, again, I, this phrase was given to me a couple of years ago, and I, you probably have already heard of it, but to live at the speed of trust. Mm-hmm. And I said that the other day, and then somebody even mirrored that back to me. So, oh, then I could actually hear what I had said. And it's to actually do that, not just say the phrase or throw it out occasionally, but to live that way. I mean, I'm like, that's mm-hmm. like the biggest responsibility we each yeah. have. And if we can do that just right yeah, now, when yeah. my husband comes and I, well, I want to like get out of here, I'm busy, you know, not do that. 
but to just to ask yourself, okay, who am I right now? And if we did that all the time, the earth would be fine. We wouldn't be destroying it if we were living at that speed. That's all. I don't know. Yeah. Any other? Yeah. That I love that. Very, Thank you. In some ways, that sounds very feminine. That sounds divinely feminine. And, and I have to say that your Hebrew ancestors do not, by any stretch, have a monopoly on patriarchy. Um, it's pretty widespread, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is why we need our mother, our, our, all of us need our, our universal mother, you know, the, the earth. And we also, you know, we get closer to our mother when we, when we recognize, uh, the matriarchal societies, uh, the indigenous ones, uh, that do, uh, who are close to the earth. Yeah. And I, and I also think, I know when my mother died, I did a whole series of images that took me about a year to process. And it wasn't just, it was like, because many of us do not have perfect relationships with our mother that's totally an embodied love. There's a lot of complications and complexity to it. And I think there's a lot of negativity against our mothers. And we carry yeah. the, this cultural thing but to actually process it and see what gave me strength. Yeah. My mother gave me a ton of strength through her rage and anger that I've had to learn to, to transform. I, I was re recently reading about Eleanor Roosevelt, you know, who's, you know, like in my imagination had been this really stalwart, you know, opinionated, you know, for and it was amazing to find out how obsequious she had to be to, uh -huh. you know, because she lived in this man's world. And yes. so she had to run everything. Be, you know, she had to run things by Franklin and she had to run things by this white supremacist president, cat presidential cabinet and, and society and journalists and on and on. But, you know, she, she kind of, you know, moved into my imagination as this really strong, vociferous person and the hoops she had to jump through. And so I think that, you know, we have lost so much by, by forcing women into these small places and turning down the volume on their voices. Oh my goodness. It's a, it's an ongoing tragedy. I, I so appreciate and I always get chills and I'm getting them now whenever I hear a man speak like that. Yes, and it, I just, I'm so grateful when I hear men who understand that because that is the rage that wants to come flying out of my mouth almost daily. I just saw, I was looking while you were talking on Instagram because literally right before we got on, I was trying to find a post that I saw where, um, and I can't remember, it was a famous woman along the lines of Eleanor Roosevelt, but it wasn't her, where she said, it's not that difficult to be called a difficult woman because, <laughs> you know, it like, there's, that's why there are so many of us because it doesn't take much. Yes, I remember. And it, yeah. yeah, right. And so, and then of course I'm thinking about, um, you know, having, I'm on the dating apps, Barb. It's a fun adventure, let me tell you. And so many times, um, just one on one in, in particular, I, I was told uh, we were having a conversation and I got the not all men comment. Not all men are like that. And I'm like, well, that's just like saying not all white people. And he said, oh, you're triggered. I'm like, I'm triggered. <laughs> I'm educated <laughs> and passionate. <laughs> like, like, how about you don't explain my emotional state to me? You know, it's just, it's, it's amazing how, um, and so I always, one of my things is instead of asking me to be nicer when I talk to you about my oppression, how about you be more resilient in hearing about my oppression? Right. And so thank you, David. I just appreciate you so much. Well, you know, it's all intersectional, right? It's, 100%. you know, we, I, you know, Ubuntu, I am not me without yes. you. And, yes. you know, uh, you know, every, every time we meet in person as a church, we pretty much hear there's a, uh, I don't know if you know Vivian Storm, Barb, but uh, she's a transgender um, oh, I um, do know. I do know her. I get stuff in emails every day. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, she's every time we meet together, she we have her sing, you know. I sent her this past Sunday. I said, you are our church's identity, you, you know, because, you, you know, it's it's like there's no such thing as overcompensating for injustice. Yeah. You, you just yeah. you just can't do enough. You 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 have to uplift those who have been marginalized and endangered. You can't do too much. So I uh, love I, and that, contrary Jimmy. to, I love you know. That. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Co contrary to popular opinion, we can do more. We can do yeah. more for women. We, we, you know, I, uh, you know, I, you know, I, that, that, I'm wait. sorry. Okay. No. Oh, that, that makes me think about the Alabama boat uh, oh. dock issue, right? Which is currently, as we're recording this, this is, you know, black TikTok is having a heyday with it. Right. And I got to say, I, I confess that I found some of it quite enjoyable because <laughs> it's just, you know, the idea of that, of, of how um, unified that resistance was and to see the joy in the Black community um, that I have seen, I'm like, I'm here for it. I am <laughs> here for it, you know, and yeah, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's, there is a... Uh, I don't know how do we even describe what happened. There was a brawl. There was a brawl between. Yeah, go look it up. Alabama yeah. boat brawl. You'll find the videos if you if you haven't already. But yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty amazing. Some of the very funny and um and very poignant things that are being passed around, especially on platforms like Black TikTok. Well, yeah. my my daughter sends me all of those things. She's. Yeah, she's into that. She's like, and she figures uh, my parents are too. So she sends me, you know, she sent me one with the, the soundtrack of Jason Aldean's song, Try That in a Small Town. And uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yes. And there's some parodies of Lift Every Voice with like, you yeah. know, Lift Every oh, Chair yeah. and things yep. like that. So, so. Barb, we've kind of edged you out of the conversation, and you're the reason we're yes, here sorry. today. Oh, no, um, yes. no, not at all. Yeah, I I'm, just, this is a treasure to us. Go ahead. I was just saying, uh, Carrie, you, you talk about the imagination. And I think for me, the creative process is like the core, everything I do every day when I wake up. Why am I here? Those are the questions I have. What am I doing here? Yes. Not just like what I make like as an artist, but like, why am I, why would I bother making anything? Right. And I think, or why would I show up at the school board? Or why would I make a public comment? Or why is this person calling me and asking me to do this thing that I, I don't know, you know, everything is a question every day. And the imagination is our only way of developing a response, our, mm. our personal creative process. That's how we work. That's how we can resist in a positive I love way. That. I love do you find that. do you find your practice informs you, you know, so that you can release your imagination? That is one of the only ways. That's why I practice it. I'm. I know that you know when these things are tr are triggered, your mind goes round and round and down and down. <laughs> it's like an endless endless thing. But if for those with a spiritual practice. That's what you do. You stop, you look inside, and and in my tradition, everything arises and it falls. That's it. And if you can stick with it long enough, it will collapse on itself, and there'll be nothing left. And your own ideas just, they collapse, all your pictures collapse, everything collapses, and then something else always arises. And once you can see that recurring pattern, it's like, oh, okay, let me let me get off the train I'm on and move over here and allow things to settle. That's why they love the 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 symbol of the of the lotus is so mm. you know, yeah. you know, it's in the mud. It grows, it has to be in mud, water and mud. And so all that dirt and crud of the earth, that's what we blossom with. Is this, tell us what it means for you to celebrate your connectivity to everything, to the universe. 
Well, the practices I've learned for the past 30 years, you make vows. And I remember when I heard the Bodhisattva vow, you know, I will save all beings. And you go, what the heck is that about, man? I, I can't even figure out my own life. How can I help anybody else? Yeah. And but as you penetrate these these ideas, the these ideas of emptiness. Emptiness is like the key point. Yeah. And emptiness is simply that arising and falling. It's just the arising and falling. And there are, they have all these words and concepts and practices, negative and positive, and how you take in the world and how you transform it through your body. And I forget what the question was, but uh, what was the question? Well, how you, how you acknowledge and participate and celebrate uh, your connectivity with everything. And actually, I'll go back to my Jewish upbringing, which is after World War II when the idea of this will never happen again, what the Nazis did will never happen again. And I don't know why, but for me, that meant for anyone ever. Mm. And I don't know how anybody else came up with only my people mm. or only me mm. and only people who look like me or come from where I am. We can never let it happen to us again. It never meant that to me. And so at a very, I just, it never, and I traveled. I traveled when I was young, I was fortunate, but it's like, how can you, all these amazing, amazing beings and not just a human being, I mean, how could we, it just doesn't make any sense to me in any way for us not to be all connected. It just makes no sense. Yeah, uh, Carrie and I interviewed uh, uh, Kyle T. Mays, who is Afro-Indigenous, mm. and, uh, you know, we talked to, to him about how there are there is a stream, I think it's a very small stream, of African-Americans, uh, American descendants of slaves, ADOS. I know we're not mentioning groups here today, but uh, that, that's out there. <laughs> but their, their consciousness is, you know, it's regarding reparations, and it's, it's of a specific Black population. You know, you can trace your ancestry to, you know, to, to enslavement. But they don't want to talk about indigenous people. Mm. You know, yes, we are, we are stolen bodies, but we live on stolen land, but that's not part of the conversation. Mm. And I do have difficulty with, you know, narrowing this down as you know, you just said, making it about, you know, my people, if you will. No, it's about people. Mm -hmm. Yep. One of the very interesting dynamics that I encounter as a white bodied person of Irish descent, right, is the whole conversation of, well, first of all, there's the whole ridiculous idea that our, the Irish were slaves too. We weren't. Let's just, let's just confirm that right now. But, but the idea of the fact that the Irish came from a struggle in Ireland that was very oppressive. It was based in imperialism and colonization. So, in many ways, um, in many, but not all, but there, there are some similarities. But then they came over here and within, within one generation were able to assimilate fully into whiteness and have forgotten, have forgotten, right? And so they, they now, so many of the, the family that I came from associate and have fully assimilated into whiteness in such a way that they enjoy all of the power and have forgotten any of their struggle unless it suits them. Right. Or have the struggle of our lineage, I should say, not their struggle because they didn't struggle, but but the, the struggle of our lineage. Right. And so it's just um, it's fascinating to me that the more we can assimilate, the more seamlessly we can assimilate into the white. Well, street, Carrie, white patriarchy, Carrie, yes. yes, the Irish have done that and bar Jews have done that. But there's some <laughs> black folks <laughs> who've gotten lost, too. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed, yes, we've seen a few of those on Fox <laughs> News. <laughs> well, actually, yeah. the, idea, the idea of passing, you know, I never thought yes. of myself in that way, but more recently I see very much I am, I have passed as white my whole life. And I, I was grateful to be able to do that because, and, and when I started hanging out with the community and people of color who, who can't do that, it made me even more clear, okay, how do I use my power? 
How do I use right. my privilege of being white? Yes, I can walk down the street and, and I do use it. Uh-huh. And I'm aware of it. And I think that's the key point uh-huh. to know when you have those privileges and how to use them. Yep. Uh, <laughs> you know, speaking of passing, um, lot, lot long ago, I, I read a book called, the title was The Personal Librarian. Mm. And, uh, this woman passed pretty much her whole life. She was African American. Mm. She became, I mean, it, it's a historical fiction, but it's, you know, I, I mean, based on actual events, um, Bella da Costa Green had to hide her identity and she eventually became the personal librarian of, of JP Morgan, which tells you the circles she uh. was moving in. The people uh-huh. she was meeting, you know, all of the, you know, robber barons and uh, she mm. was moving among these people and then going home at night and having to, you know, debrief herself. <laughs> uh, what a what a story that is. Yeah. What a life that is. What a journey to be able to process that. Especially in the, that period, you know, in the early 20s and the 30s, you know, in heavy Jim Crow. When, you know, after Woodrow Wilson, you know, resegregated the federal government and, you know, I mean, she was doing things that her own family couldn't do. You know, I mean, yeah, it, it, yeah, her own, her, her, her own father was actually a civil rights activist. Mm. Uh, yeah. he was the, he was the first African American to graduate from Harvard and, uh, and yet they were distant. Because they could not be seen together. Right. Interesting. So we're we're over an hour um, (laughs) here. And this is such a great conversation. I hate to end it. But I do want to, I want to, I think this idea of passing. So as as we wrap up here, this idea of passing, I'd love to know your thoughts, Barb. Because I think that it has ultimately at its crux is the idea of individualism as opposed to community. Right. And if, cause if you really, if you really look at that, that's like, okay, what can I do for myself and my, my own people, like my, my immediate people by passing or by assimilating or by, right? What can a, what can a white bodied Irish American do to assimilate and get what's mine or get, get my, my share of the pie? And I don't have to worry about my black and brown siblings or my Jewish siblings or my, LGBTQ siblings, right? So like, how do we move from this place of individualism to communal <laughs> wellness, right? I think that's kind of the crux of that of that matter. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts in, in closing on that? I think always, and that's uh, the new somatic, uh, what do they call it? I don't know. I can't remember the name for this new, it's not new, but it's been the past 20 years of including our body in our practices. Mm -hmm. Um, It is always our own body in relationship to the community. Yes. And that's the only way I can practice anything I do. And that's if you're doing community work, that is always. And you have to take care of yourself. So when they say you're taking care of your body, it's in order to be a part of something greater. You can't take care of yourself. You're no good to anybody else. But if you're only good to yourself, then you're not helping anybody else. I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Barb, the fact that you exist and you have, uh, you know, entered this space and occupied this space in particular, I think is you know, it's, it's helpful for, for Carrie and myself, but I think that there will be many, many people who, I don't want to overstate this, but who are going to be rescued by you. Yeah. Um, and sometimes we just need to be rescued from ourselves and our ideas. We need someone to help nudge us. You know, we've all had that. We wouldn't be here if there weren't people participating in our redemption. Indeed. So, Indeed. <laughs> With so much grace. (laughs) Thank you, both of you. And David, just having, you are the reason I wrote this piece. Mm. 
you nudged me. And so I had to go through a lot of things to get that little piece on that paper. You know, so I'm super grateful to you because it's been so clarifying to me. And that clarity that we feel, that's, that feeds us. And then we can keep going. And then we're just so filled with joy and so grateful for being in community with others that, oh, it's worth it. We've heard it said before, nobody is coming to save us. We're saving ourselves. We yes. are the ones we've been waiting for. <laughs> Indeed. I love it. Thank you. So good. So good. Well, thank you so much, Barb. It was such a pleasure to meet you and to have this conversation. I so appreciate it. Yeah. You know, thank you both so much. This has been such a pleasure and I hope it continues in other ways. Yes. Same. It will. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. We are people who have left behind performance-based religion and the shame that comes with it. Maybe you have a personal liberation story to tell and we want to know about it. Please contact us on Twitter at God is not an asshole or text 805-703-8393 because the world needs to know that God is not an asshole.